All right, today we're going to check the work that you have done for today, beginning with the questions in the textbook. So first of all, the questions on page 282. Check your own paper, honestly, wisely, carefully. Page 282. I see you had to do uh, all the questions on that page. Number one, why did John Brown raise the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry? What do you say, Lydia? Brown wanted to start a general slave revolt in the South and establish a state for free slaves in the Allegheny Mountains between Maryland and Virginia. A very complete answer. And uh, you're close enough that hopefully that got picked up. But otherwise, we all need to speak loudly. All right? So, what you needed to have for a correct answer here, here is that he wanted to secure arms, get weapons, in order to supply slave uprisings in the South. So, kind of a twofold getting weapons for slaves. Any questions? You need to have that in order to get credit. No questions? All right. Uh, number two. The four presidential candidates and their parties in the election of 1860. So give me the candidate and their party. Who wants to go through all of those? Caleb. Stephen Douglas was a Northern Democrat. Or if you just had Democrat, that's fine. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, John Breckenridge was a Southern Democrat. Or you could just say Democrat. <laughs> okay. No, no he's, he's doing exactly the right thing. I'm just... For those that weren't as precise, yeah. Stephen. No, I have that. It's just like, dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to say uh, a pot but now it's all this. It's okay. <laughs> Go on. John Bell was Constitutional <laughs> Union, and Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. Correct. And each, each person and their party is worth a point. So there are eight points on number two. Any questions about any of yours? All right, number three, uh, which was the first southern state to secede from the Union and when? Sally. Um, South Carolina, December 20th. That is correct. For the when, if you just have the month and the year, that's fine. South Carolina. Any questions? Two points. Did you get it, Haley? Yeah. Number four. What event marked the beginning of the Civil War? Jessica. Um, I have to, uh, speak, to speak up, please. The spark came over the issue of federal courts, or wait, no, courts, specifically Fort Sumter, centered in Charleston, Harbor. Okay, I wasn't sure where you were going when you started, but you ended up in the right place. Okay. It was the firing on Fort Sumter is the beginning of the war. Any question? All right, now we move to the worksheets. Wait, what about content, content number seven? Oh. oh, you want to go ahead and do that? Uh, I had it listed later, so but we might as well do it while we're here. Okay, content question number seven on page 283. How did most northerners react to Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry? Well, Hannah, what do you say? I, everyone I know mourned for him, but abolition, abolitionists saw his death as a useful symbol for slavery. Okay, the question is how did most Northerners react? And I'm not sure that you've told us uh, the answer to that. Alex? The majority of Northerners did not support slaves revolting or Brown's method. Okay, that uh, didn't support Brown's method. That's a, a nice way of saying it. Uh, anybody have another way of saying it, Sarah? I see that they denounced Brown's action. Yeah, they denounced it. They condemned it. Something along those lines. Michaela? I have Northerners reacted with many Southerners have saying it was a horrible crime and did not support him. Yes. That, that's good. Joey? With outrage to be okay? Sure. Let's go. Yeah. All right, and then the second part of the question is how did most abolitionists react? How did abolitionists react? Nate? 
Uh, they approved it. They like, praised him for it. Yeah, they praised him, glorified him. One even said he was uh, equivalent with Christ. I said uh, a justful act. I didn't just say that, but that's what, how I said what they thought it was. Why don't you read your answer? They, the abolitionists thought it was a justful act comparing Braun to Christ. Okay. See how much better that was than just telling me. I was just trying to keep it simple. You know? Yeah. It didn't work out that way, though, did it? Nope. <laughs> Caleb. Uh, I had it. They thought that his death was a useful symbol for slavery. Okay. okay. Alex? I said that the abolitionists used his death as a symbol, and many writers compared Brown, Brown with Christ. Okay. Joey? I saw that they were for it. The abolitionists were for it. Okay. Put in simple terms. That's. Yeah. Did this need to be terribly specific? Because I just had that they, the abolitionists praised his action. No, that's fine. I, I think that's where we started. Mm -hmm. Saying that they praised and glorified it. Okay, so now, can we go on to the worksheets? Are we ready? No, Caleb? Um, so I missed <laughs> one of the two sections of the last question. And number seven or yeah. two points? Okay. Sorry, I didn't mention that. Number seven is worth two points. All right, now we go to uh, the worksheets. First of all, worksheet 78, which on the bottom is page 294. How many candidates ran for election in 1856? Haley? Louder, please. Three. That is correct. Who were they? Sophia? John C. Fremont. Is that his name? Fremont. And then Miller, Fillmore, and James <coughs> Butch, and then Buchanan. Buchanan. <laughs> so, yeah, and their last names are fine. <laughs> Buchanan, Fremont, and Fillmore. Three points for that part, one for the other, so number one is worth four points. Any questions? No. Number two, which candidate received the most electoral votes? Megan? Buchanan. <laughs> everybody, everybody say it together. Buchanan. Buchanan. Again, Buchanan. Buchanan. No. How about we know that? Any question? Number three. Which candidate received the fewest electoral votes? Sally. Right. And how many did he receive, Joey? Eight. Correct. Which state voted for him? <laughs> Steph. Maryland. Correct. Okay. So three points for number three. Number four, which candidate received the most popular votes? Devin. Buchanan. Correct. What percentage of the popular votes did he receive? Lydia? 45%. Correct. So two points for number four. Any questions? Number five, how many electoral votes did Fremont receive? <laughs> Lahana. Uh, 114. Correct. Number six. If the states that voted for Fremont had voted for Fillmore instead, would Fillmore have won the election? Um, how many of you said yes? Good. So you get one point for saying no. Let's go. And then another point if you give the right reason. What's the right reason? Jessica? I said no, can I would still have more states than both of them combined? Yes. Well, <clears throat> if it's not combined, yeah, both of them combined, okay, I see what you're saying, right. Um, he still wouldn't have had uh, more than he can. Michaela? I have because he still would have had a lesser percentage of the Right. Yes. I just said that the Democratic votes were over 50%, so it's not possible. So it's what? So it's not possible. <coughs> not possible? What was not possible? For Fillmore to win the election. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is he still had less. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. In different words? Yeah. Okay. Uh, two points to number six. Next we have the reading study guide, which is uh, pages 147 to 148. Uh, slavery <laughs> dominates politics. Uh, first, you had to fill in the chart. 
What did you put for the Democrats' view towards slavery? Aiden? They were pro-slavery. They, okay, they, or they supported it, they were for it. Uh, you could have put neutral, because there were some Democrats that were neither for nor against. Michaela? Okay, I think they were blamed for bloody chambers. That's not a view towards slavery. Are you looking at the right one? There's a section there about... You're looking at the, the chart that says political party view towards slavery and the candidate. Yes. And under view towards slavery, the Democrats, you had to blame for bloody hands. <laughs> but that's not their view towards slavery. So you misunderstood what you're, what you're doing there. Lydia? I had that they were neutral because they wanted to keep the union together like with and without slavery. Yeah, that's why I said one of the okay. possibilities was neutral. All right, and then... Um, who was their candidate in 1856? Joey? Buchanan. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. <Kenny. Kenny. laughs> uh, you want to say it the right way? Buchanan. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right, then the Republicans' view towards slavery was what? Jill? They were against it. Mm-hmm. Or opposed it. And who was their candidate in 1856? Nate? Uh, Fremont. Right. The uh, Whigs' view towards slavery was what, Alex? I said split. Right, they were split. And their candidate in 1856 was, hmm, Haley. Fillmore. Right, Fillmore. So we got six possible points there. Any question? All right, then over on the right hand side, you have why did the Republicans nominate Fremont for the presidency in 1856? Uh, a couple of reasons you might have put. Haley, what'd you say? I mean, not uh, Hayden. Uh, <coughs> you know, it starts with an H. Uh, he was in favor of admitting California and Kansas as free states. Right, that, so that would be one reason. Anybody have a different reason? There's another one that maybe. Is even more important, at least a lot of elections. Michaela? Yeah, he's a war hero. Uh, so often our presidential candidates are war heroes. All right, so the seven points on that page. Then page 148. Uh, the candidates in the 1856 election and the parties they represented, well, you know, this is kind of a repeat of what you already did. Hopefully, you put these things together well. Uh, so the uh, candidates. And their party. So give me one candidate and his party, Alex. You'd be Cannon and Democrats. That's right. That's, well, two points. Give me another one, Megan. Now that he took the top one. Right, Fremont Republican. And what's the third one? Haley. Right. Or you could have put no nothing party instead of we. Six points there. Any questions? All right, then drop down to number three. What was the Supreme Court ruling in the Dred Scott case? Let me just give you a summary, and you can see whether you think you're fit. Um, basically, I mean, you could have put, pointed out that they said slaves were property. Uh, that you could have pointed out that the slave owners had the right to own slaves, that, and that was protected by the Constitution. And you could have pointed out that <coughs> as a slave, he was not a U.S. citizen. Dred Scott was not a U.S. citizen. So any or a combination of those, anybody have an answer they're not sure about? Very important case in the Supreme Court. <clears throat> okay, number four, the main issue in the Lincoln-Douglas debates was what? Sophia? Expansion of slavery. Exactly. If you put slavery, half a point. Ooh. That wasn't the issue. It was the expansion of slavery. Neither of them came out against slavery or necessarily pro-slavery, they were against expansion of slavery, or, or the issue was expansion of slavery. Uh, Douglas uh, didn't see a problem with it, and Lincoln wanted to not have any more expansion. All right, any question there? Expansion of slavery really is the only acceptable answer. Yes. When Lincoln won, I heard some story that Douglas was like, let me wear your top hat or something like that. <laughs> I don't, never heard that. Wow. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I wasn't in the National Honor Society. So <laughs> yeah. Google <laughs> 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 it after. Let's see what I'm talking about. I doubt that that's true. It actually happens. He said what? I read it in a book. <laughs> he did what? One duck and slots two I don't know. And you all can check on the internet. Wait, Lincoln, what did I not find it? No, I'm just saying no, you Google it. Why? Okay. Wait. Any other questions? Any other fanciful stories you want to bring up? Oh my gosh. All right. All right. Number five. Why did John Brown attack the arsenal on Harper's Ferry? We've already had this, so hopefully it's not double jeopardy if you miss and watch you miss it again. Uh, Alex. To inspire slaves to fight by capturing weapons. Yes. Very good. Ooh. Weapons for slaves. Any question? All right. The next <coughs> page is worksheet 78 and 79, a different 78 and 79. <coughs> Which are on pages 78 and 79. Okay. On page, or worksheet 78, the Southern Views on Slavery. Uh, number one, the most important details of Corey's description of slavery on his plantation. Uh, I, t I, I don't, I'm not going to take points on this because I have to probably read every one of yours to determine it. So let's just talk about these. They're not going to count one way or the other. Uh, Devin, what did you say? Um, slaves have it better than poor people in other countries. They have light, easy work, and slaves are happy and contented. Okay, very good. Any other, anything you want to add to that? Michaela? Yeah, they need, um, treat them well and give them what they need and provide the protection they need. Okay, good. They're protected and comfortable. Okay. Alex? I had labor provided clothing and uh, acreage to farm on. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, the next one, the two main points in Fitzhugh's defense of the slave system. What uh, did you have as his two main points? Sally? I had that not all people are created equally and that the weak must be enslaved by the strong for their own good. Okay. That's good. Uh, you might have Let's put it a different way, anybody? Michaela? I mean, quality, getting quality. Nature has made black slaves. Nature has made black slaves. Black <clears throat> slaves. Okay. Uh, the two points I have are that some men are born to be slaves, which reflects a lot of what you said, and others that some are made to be slave owners. Uh, no one's really mentioned that, but that was a point he was making as well. Number three, compare and contrast Horry's view of slavery with that of Fitzhugh. Uh, so what would you say was the main emphasis of what Horry had to say about slaves? Uh, Stephen? Well, I'd say for the similar part, they're similar because they both think it's okay. But Horry yeah. only thinks it's okay since it's not hard on the slaves and it's like, it's comfortable and easy. Yeah, so Horry's uh, kind of emphasizing that masters are generally good to their slaves. They take care of their slaves, right? What did Fitzhugh have to say about masters? Michaela? They were meant to be masters. They were meant to be masters, and even advocates treated them harshly. So that's the main difference between the two. Uh, which Number four, which one do you think gives a more accurate picture? What do you think, Alex? I said boring because most uh, slave owners were kind to their slaves. Okay. Anybody um, else, Stephen? I said that to you, even though not all cases were as severe as his, it still shows why slavery was just wrong in general and why it's wrong no matter what. Okay. I have that. Or it gives you a more accurate view of slave life because it's just like about like what slave counts But it like, gives you a more accurate description of the thought behind slavery. Okay, that, that's a, a thoughtful comparison or contrast between the two. Uh, yeah, so we might agree more with what Fitz you had to say about the reasons behind it or the attitudes uh, about slavery. But Hori does give more details, more uh, facts about it. Okay, number five. Uh, what points would they agree? Uh, you pretty much said that slavery is okay, it's a good institution. And uh, so let's wander to page 79, or activity 79. Is that right? Yeah. And that's looking at Uncle Tom's cabin. Have any of you read Uncle Tom's cabin? Yeah. 
Raise your hands if you've read off the top of your Okay, several of you. Uh, I recommend it. I, I haven't, I started reading it some time ago and I had it on, I don't know, I think my tablet or something, and then something happened that I wasn't using it anymore for reading, so I, I didn't get it finished. But I was surprised <coughs> how good it was. Uh, my impression had always been it was just like a propaganda piece, probably not well written. But she did a good job of being very balanced. I was surprised at how she portrayed uh, some good masters, how she portrayed uh, relationships between people in a, a very balanced way, I thought, very objective way. So I, I would uh, recommend uh, reading it. Uh, and, and this is from someone who really had only been in the South once. Uh, but she has a good grasp of how things work. All right, so, um, and we're not going to take points on this one either. Uh, what do you think, uh, number one, what do you think appealed to people <clears throat> in her writing? What do you think appealed to them? Uh, Joey, what do you think? Maybe sympathy. Did you say sympathy? Yeah. Okay. Having sympathy with the, the slaves? Uh, Sally? Yeah, it, it does. I would say it really does seem real, what she's writing. It well, shows good research. Mikaela? It's melodramatic and sentimental, yet it depicts the destruction of the slaves in Washington. Yeah, melodramatic, and what was the next thing you said? Uh, sentimental. Sentimental. It depicted the destructiveness of slavery. Destructiveness of slavery. And owners alike. And to, uh, and to uh, slaves and owners alike. Okay. Speak louder next time so I don't need to repeat everything. Uh, he has some good comments there, so say them loud. Uh, number two, how does So use the concept of good and evil? in her characters. So let's go down to number three. It's a novel. How important was it that it be accurate? It's just a novel. Does it matter if it's accurate or not? What do you say, Stephen? So people understood the injustice of the matter. Yeah, if it wasn't accurate, then people could just toss it aside. And, and many did. Uh, but uh, So it's important that it's uh, accurate. Number four. How do you think this novel was probably received in the South? Sophia? I said they probably didn't receive it well because it made it seem like the slave owner was merciless and a savage, which makes it seem like all slave owners were that bad. Right. Uh, in fact, it was banned. <laughs> it made, I'm not sure of all the South, but in many places, uh, it's not allowed to even be sold. Uh, number five, in what way do you think Stowe's novel may have contributed to the Civil War? Did it did it contribute and how? Jessica? Um, I said this novel brought up questions. Louder, please. This novel brought up questions of these people and started conversations on the ethics of slavery and whether it could be logically justified or not. Yeah, so it brought up issues that uh, people needed to think about to address. And eventually, uh, I mean, it did sway people that were on the fence toward a more abolitionist or anti-slavery position. <clears throat> uh, so much so that, rightly or wrongly, Abraham Lincoln, when he met Harriet Beecher Stowe, said, oh, so you're the little lady who started this big war. So he, he kind of credited her with uh, bringing about the, uh, the uh, so much of uh, uh, antagonism toward slavery. All right, next. Well, that was it, wasn't it? Okay, so uh, 70, the last 78 and 79 we're not counting, so count up the points that we have prior to that. <coughs> what about the others? Are we putting them all together? Or two we're, putting, we're putting all the points together. Or with the, with book the section. The book questions and the worksheet questions. We're putting all together. Oh, thank you. 43 points total. I didn't miss any. And I think so that your scores are not put on YouTube for everyone to hear. Um, I will uh, get those from you at the end of the period. Uh, right now, I want us to take a quick look through chapter 13. 
So just turn, open your books to chapter 13. <coughs> um, where are you so I didn't read the book. Okay. Um, chapter 13. Uh, just look on with somebody next to you so we don't take a lot of time. Because we don't have much time left. Page 261 is the uh, first page with text on it of chapter 13, A House Dividing. Uh, you can see at the very beginning the first main subject is called Controversy, New Territories, Old Questions. Uh, now, we saw before, as I showed you on slides, that the United States had expanded greatly, and partly through the Mexican War. The Mexican War, we added a lot of territory. Louisiana purchased the largest amount. Mexican War, we received a lot as well. Uh, it was the single, uh, the largest mm -hmm. single acquisition of territory uh, that we uh, had. Uh, oh, okay, even larger than the Louisiana territory. And so uh, that brought about the issues of um, what's going to happen with these territories as they become states. Uh, the Wilmot Proviso, if you see on page 262, uh, prohibited slavery in any territory acquired from Mexico. Of course, that was rejected by the Senate, which had enough Southern votes to keep that from passing. Then the Calhoun resolutions uh, came from uh, John C. Calhoun, who was a uh, South Carolina senator, and uh, he said that the territories are the common possession of the states and not the federal government. So he's a states' rights guy. And so slave owners have the same constitutional protections of their property there as they do in their home states. <clears throat> then, of course, that was not accepted by the northern states. The idea of popular sovereignty in which residents <coughs> of the territory should decide on the status of slavery uh, became uh, promoted, and uh, largely by Stephen Douglas of Illinois, the one who debated against Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he said the the territory itself, when they're becoming a state, should the people there should decide whether they should be a slave state or a free state. Now, in the election of 1848, the uh, Democrats nominated Lewis Cass, who championed the idea of popular sovereignty, and the Whigs. Uh, avoided slavery altogether by nominating uh, Zachary Taylor, who was promoted not because of any position on slavery, but because he was a war hero. He was a general in the Mexican War. And so uh, he was nominated and uh, was uh, elected. Um, uh, he, uh, he, uh, uh, the, the Whig Party also then uh, nominated uh, a former president, which is pretty unusual, as vice president. I'm sorry, no, the, the, another party, Free Soul Party, nominated uh, former president Martin Van Buren as a candidate. Um, and uh, he divided the Democratic vote, <clears throat> now allowing Taylor to win. All right, then in California, we have the gold rush. You're familiar with that. Uh, the 49ers, it was discovered in 1849, and so people went out there. We're called 49ers. Um, which led to an explosion of population in California, enough so that in a very short period of time, they had, had enough people to want to become a state. And so they're going to come in as a free state. So that presents a problem once again for trying to keep slave and free states equal in the United States. Uh, so there's a great debate that takes place during this time between three great speakers, Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun, and Daniel Webster. Um, have you read in the literature class uh, the, uh, the poem about Daniel Webster, The Devil and Daniel Webster? Have you read that? Okay, it's a very famous poem about when Daniel Webster is arguing a case against the devil himself. <coughs> That's how highly regarded uh, Webster was. Uh, John C. Calhoun, as I said, was a spokesman for the South and pro-slavery. Henry Clay was the great compromiser. He tried to find 
compromises all the time. And these three men were uh, three great speakers of their time. So uh, the uh, end result of, of their, uh, their efforts was that uh, California would come as a free state, uh, the slave trade would be abolished in the District of Columbia, but not slavery itself. Uh, slavery would be protected there. Uh, the new territories of New Mexico and Utah would be organized without reference to or restrictions on slavery. Now, this is called the Compromise of 1850. And let's see, let's, if you go over to page 267, well, 266, you see a map showing the results of the 1850 Compromise, which were free states, which are slave states, and which are open. On uh, 267, you see a picture of Daniel Webster, and uh, also a poster cautioning colored people of Boston to watch out who you talk to, because there are slave catchers that are going after any black people they see and uh, taking them into slavery, whether they were a slave or not. And that's just the truth of it. On 268, there is a box there talking about the Underground Railroad. You might find that interesting to look at. On 269, we have then the conflict in Kansas uh, coming about as a result of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Uh, and that was from uh, Stephen Douglas pushing popular sovereignty uh, because he wanted to have a railroad built through Illinois, his state. And uh, as a part of that, uh, Kansas and Nebraska were allowed to decide their own fate. Uh, those two territories were organized from the region and uh, would would uh, be it would be determined by popular sovereignty as to whether they'd be slave or not. Uh, Southerners, of course, welcomed this opportunity to flood the area of Kansas with as many Southerners as they could, so that when the vote came, they could win that as a slave state. Uh, of course, those that were against slavery also moved in the area and uh, try to eliminate the vote count by just simply killing the other side. So there's a lot of killing going on between, from one side to the other, which is how I got the nickname Bloody Kansas. At this point, then we have the rise of a new political party. Uh, the Whigs fall apart, uh, and basically the Know Nothing Party uh, morphs into, uh, or, or, or uh, a new party is formed from the Know Nothings, from the Free Soil, uh, from the Whigs, uh, there's a new party called the Republican Party, which is birthed in 1854. Uh, they became known generally as an anti-slavery party. Uh, they were not against slavery per se, primarily though, they were simply against expanding slavery into the territories. Their, their position was, let slavery alone in the, sla in the slave states, in the southern states, but we're not going to let it expand any further. Which seemed to be a somewhat sensible position, if you, even if you're against slavery. To try to go in and, and uh, take away slaves in the South would have, would have been, and it turned out to be later, a, a very <coughs> difficult thing to do. <clears throat> and in the election of 1856, the first uh, time they put forth a presidential candidate, it was John C. Fremont, who was a hero of the Mexican War, a hero in California, um, and uh, so he came out for free speech, free press, free soil, free men, uh, Fremont and victory was the slogan. On uh, 272, we see that the Democrats selected James Buchanan as their candidate to try to unify the party and the people of the country. Uh, it was on to talk about bleeding Kansas there, which uh, I've already mentioned. Uh, you see the Brooks Sumner episode where a South Carolina senator attacks another senator in the Senate, uh, hitting him with his cane. There's a picture of it on 273. Uh, Southerners were rejoiced over uh, this effort by their Southern representative in uh, the Senate. And uh, apparently a lot of people sent him canes in the mail to replace the broken ones that he had used on uh, Senator Charles Sumner. 
Uh, the Dred Scott decision, we've talked about a little bit today already. You read about it and answered questions. Uh, so uh, we won't say anything more about that, except that on 273, the last paragraph, you notice the Chief Justice of the time was Roger Taney. Uh, he was a Southerner and uh, definitely leaned the Supreme Court in that direction so that the decisions that were made, along with the other justices, but he was a, a pro-slavery man. So the Dred Scott decision was a decision that came about because of his prejudice in that area. By the way, John Brown uh, was involved in Lindy, Kansas before he was in, became involved in the, the raid in uh, uh, to gain weapons for the, the slaves. Uh, he got his inspiration for that raid by attending a church service <coughs> just a few miles from here in Hudson, Ohio. He was attending a church service there and uh, the pastor's message against slavery inspired him to go and do something about it. So uh, that's that got him on the road then. Um, so we had the Lincoln Douglas debates, which you've read about. Uh, kind of promoted Lincoln onto uh, the public stage. Uh, Douglas won the election, but Lincoln won some admiration from people. And again, the heart of the controversy was not black equality, but the expansion of slavery. Uh, Lincoln said mm -hmm. that he did not think that black people were equal to whites. He didn't think they should be on juries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He just didn't think that they, they should be slaves. Uh, so it wasn't a matter of equality, it was just a matter of expanding slavery. <clears throat> uh, John Brown's raid is next, which we've talked about at Harpers Ferry, Virginia. It's uh, called Harpers Ferry, Virginia, because at the time it was Virginia. Now it's in the state of West Virginia, which we'll talk about how that came about later on. Uh, John Brown uh, was hung for his attack on a federal arsenal. And uh, you read some of the things about him. Uh, one prominent New England pastor said, John Brown has made the gallows more glorious than the cross. Imagine that. The election of 1860 then, uh, Buchanan, had the only bachelor president, by the way, that's ever occupied the, the White House, uh, was, uh, uh, but he was a, a, a person that uh, uh, did not attempt to uh, stop what was proceeding. Uh, and especially as uh, the Republican Lincoln was elected, it appeared to Southerners as though uh, their days were numbered that the Republicans would start, they would not be able to survive. All right, so uh, look, we almost uh, talked about the whole chapter ourselves. I'll look it over. Uh, we're going to have an open book test on this uh, the next day we meet, which maybe is Monday. Tuesday. Tuesday. All right, so it'll be open book, but you won't have time to look up everything, so be familiar with what's there. Steve, are we going to give you a grade? Then we'll do that on Monday. All right.